Welcome to the Valve and Process Solutions Visionaries podcast, where we meet some of the most fascinating folk involved in the development and implementation of valves, actuators, and other engineering solutions. Today's guest, Mr. Mick Pepper, and what a fascinating story he has to tell. Enjoy the podcast. Good afternoon, Mick. Thanks so much for joining me on the podcast this afternoon. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, quite looking forward to this uh, discussion and uh, we'll see where it takes us. Let's see where it takes us indeed. So we were just chatting before we started the podcast. You said if you cut, if you were to cut yourself in half, then it would say Norbro. You were involved with the initial design for the Norbro actuator over 50 years ago. Um, but uh, you've had a uh, an amazing story to tell. T- tell us about uh, developing the Norbro and what you were doing at the time. You were working with Norris Brothers. T- tell us more. Yeah, well, you've got to go back a stage. Um, I was Norris Brothers' first uh, engineering apprentice. Uh, I joined them in 1964. Um, I had my interview with uh, Ken Norris, and there, there were four brothers in Norris Brothers. They were fantastic engineers, but the four brothers had the whole company within themselves. It was Ken Norris, who was a a chartered engineer, uh, Lou Norris, an aeronautical engineer, Eric Norris, a chartered accountant, and uh, Leslie Norris, who was a builder. So they built their own buildings, ran their own accounts, had their own in-house engineers, and they were development engineers, research and development. Very exciting times. As I say, I joined in 1964 as their first apprentice, and I think I was employee number seven. So it was a long time ago. Employee I didn't number seven? I didn't get involved with the design of the Norbro, but I did get involved with the manufacture of it uh, and turning up prototype bits and pieces for it and working with the... The main principal designer was a guy called Alan Bunyard. Right. Uh, yeah. And a very clever chap. Very clever. So let's just, um, let's just go back. What was it then that uh, made you join? Why, what had you been doing immediately before that? Right. Now, now I left before, school. Before Norris's, sorry. Um, I, I left school having seen the youth employment officer at school who offered me a choice of two jobs. One was a milk round because I said I wanted to travel. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> right. And the other job was this apprenticeship at Norris Brothers. Yes. Um, and I hadn't given engineering a thought at the time. But I went along and I had an interview with Ken Norris. Um, the brothers always worked by initials. So Ken was KW Norris. Lou was L.H. Norris, Eric, the accountant, was E.A., and Leslie, the builder, was L.F. L.A., no, L.F., L.F. Norris. Hmm. Um, So I had my interview with Ken Norris, and, I mean, this guy's a a very senior engineer. He's a a genius of his day. He's the the Mr. Dyson of his day. Nice. but he just asked me a few questions, and one of which I can remember, he said, uh, what's your hobbies? What do you like doing, lad? And I said, oh, I love Meccano. And he said, well, that's very good. And what had I done in the school holidays? And I said, I built a shed. And mm-hmm. after that, he just well, you can start Monday, if you like. And I started at three pounds a week. Yeah, right, um, three pounds a week. And how old were you then, exactly, Mick? I was just six, well, uh, 15 and a half. Yeah. Um, that was my first proper job, and it was my first and only interview I've had in my life. I, I've stayed with the company 45 years. Yes. Uh, I've been retired 10 years nearly, um, but I never had another interview for a, a, an entrance job, as it were. That was it. Goodness <laughs> me. So yeah. isn't it a good job, though? You, uh, you you didn't take the other option that was presented to you by <laughs> your careers <laughs> advisor. Yeah. Well, I always knew I wanted to travel. And, of course, with Norris, I, was, I did land up traveling because, in the end, I was export sales manager. And um, 
And that, that must have been interesting. That must have taken you uh, a number of places. I'd love to come back to that in a moment. But you, you said that, uh, in effect, uh, the Norris brothers um, were really, really innovative. Um, and you described one of them as sort of Dyson of, of their time. And, and their, uh, m- many folk might not necessarily know of uh, some of the designs that the Norris brothers came, came yeah. up with. And yep. perhaps you can tell us a little bit more. I can indeed. They um, they um, worked in conjunction with Britex and invented the inertia seat belt that is in every single car in the world today. Right. That, now, that was a phenomenal uh, invention. And we opened a, uh, a, shop, a workshop within a workshop. Uh, it's called the Sussex Seat Belt Centre. And it was the first purpose-made place where anyone could take a car and have a seat belt retrofitted, because seat belts weren't fitted to cars full stop. No. And uh, the the shop within a shop, uh, seat, Sussex Seat Belt Centre, was opened by uh, Donald Campbell. Now the association with Donald Campbell is that Norris Brothers designed both the car. Um, KN7, as K7, sorry, and the boat CN7, Cor- uh, Campbell Norris, um, both of which set the land speed record and the water speed record in the same year. And that they did both the boat and the car. That's remarkable. So the Norris brothers designed the hydroplane boat Bluebird, and that yeah. set the water speed record on Coniston Water, yep. and they designed the gas turbine-powered Bluebird car as well. And mm-hmm. Donald Campbell attempted the land speed record. So, he achieved it. He didn't um, attempt it. He achieved, achieved it. Yeah, achieved yeah. It as well. Yeah. Um, other thing that they invented was every, every gas stove in the country or gas device has got a piezo crystal ignition they they developed and invented that piezo so the, crystal, the spark the piezo the, crystal ignition where you press the button and it goes click and there's a lights the gas that was their invention so this was a hotbed of innovation the uh the, the Nor- working with the norris brothers um, yeah. and it must have been fascinating for you as a youngster in your first job after your first ever interview for a job to to begin working with them and you got the job as you said because you liked Meccano you loved Meccano and you you built your own shed and um and they thought this this be handy with his hands (laughs) (laughs) amazing so what did they set you to work on initially, Mick? What, what, what well, the, the very first, I can, it's stupid, isn't it? I can, after even all these years, I can remember the first jobs where I, I made some copper rings um, for welding in, so tubes could be welded without the weld penetration bead going inside the, the tube and obstructing the flow. Um and I remember that so well because they, they said, well, you can cut them off with a hacksaw um, and they're not accurate. Anything within a sixteenth of an inch. Like, oh, my God, those those tiny things on rulers, sixteenth of an inch. <laughs> but, of course, later on, we were working to microns. Yes, quite. Because they were always at the forefront of technology. We had the first, we had the first computer in Sussex, for example. Did you? We had IBM computer... And IBM used the, the 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 office as their showroom. They didn't have another computer outside of London. Right, okay. Uh, we had the first NC machine, uh, numerical control. We had yes. the first NC machines. But that's, that was all in the years to come. Everything they developed, they would start a new company. So eventually there were... I really don't know the total figure, but I would think it was in excess of 50 companies. Every project manager that made the project successful became the director of that company, with Norris Brothers being in overall control. 
But yeah. if the project worked and it was successful, then they'd, they'd, they'd start a company that made and developed that product further. Yes. And it if, was that, uh, if interesting way of or... carrying on business. Right. That's really interesting. So they, they were protecting themselves in the event of um, uh, innovative ideas not working and not bringing mm. down other um, parts of the business by having um, separate entities. Yeah, um, there, there was a television program called Tomorrow's World with Raymond Baxter. I, don't know I remember heard of that. Tomorrow's World. Yeah, well, they were there filming nearly every month at Norris Brothers right. to see what coming out, what was next, what was happening next. It was uh, it was a hot bed of uh, ideas and innovative um, procedures and goings on. Yes. With with valves, with um, even cement making machines. They had a machine for third world countries that would lay a road as it trundled along on earth. So the machine, a huge great tractor device, yeah. would mix and mould cement out behind itself to make a, a road, literally. <laughs> Gosh, that's remarkable, isn't it? So... Massive. Massive thing. They made um, they made the first dockside tractors to handle um, uh, freight containers. What are they called the, uh, the big containers, shipping containers. Oh, shipping containers. Right. Uh, well, they made the first tractor units to move those in the docks, and we had big, um, well, <laughs> dockside type tractor units that could lift containers and move them around. Gosh. That was a Norris uh, development. And so we had our carriers from the army, the British Army, and we put gas turbine engine, rover gas turbine engines in. Every every week there was something new going on. It was an amazing place. So it must have been thoroughly exciting. And in your early years, there those those first few years when you were sort of uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, obviously being yep. thrown into an exciting world, how did your responsibility grow and how quickly were you given responsibility for projects of your own? And very quickly. Um, I did my apprenticeship and I went to uh, Brighton Tech mm. Oh, excuse me, just have a drink of water. Uh, Brighton Tech. <coughs> um, I finished my apprenticeship at 21. Uh, they Im immediately made me a charge hand in the machine shop and then foreman very quickly. And I think by the time I was 23, I was manager of the Norbro actuator plant at Bolney on the, on the A23. Right, so that's... that's um, a, a very young ascendancy and a very young age to be manager of of the plant at, at 23 um yeah. we when we started this podcast uh, we said uh, you have sort of norbro running through you so um tell me a, a little bit more then about how the uh, norbro actuator came to be 50 years ago and, and how it came to be designed and any challenges on, on the way, any difficulties in moving to, to, to production and development? It was literally one of the very first actuators. It may, there's some, always some dispute about which one was the first, whether it was us or, or, or somebody else, but Norbro stands for Norris Brothers, incidentally. I don't know if you know that. Mm. Um, that's where the name came from. But it was certainly one of the very first pneumatic actuators. And it's a brilliant concept and design because prior to pneumatic actuators, valves used to be actuated by putting an air cylinder onto the lever, the hand lever, mm -hmm. and the air cylinder would actuate and push the lever to open or close the valve. Right. Well, yeah. About the early 60s, that uh, computers start coming around and so you can see that automation is going to be a, a, a red-hot subject. And the Norrises developed the Norbro by... It's a, it is a double-acting air cylinder, 
within its given length, instead of having one cylinder working against the air, it's got two pistons effectively giving twice as much power as an air cylinder of a given the same length. Brilliant idea. So you've got one piston on one side and another piston operating on the other side of a central rack. And as that piston moves, it revolves the rack. And to save everything or stop everything getting jammed up and also taking the wear away from the bore of the cylinder, because otherwise the bore would wear out, they had these things called guide rods. Fantastic idea, because they take all the load mm. and spread it equally and evenly on a, a bearing material made of nylon. Uh, it saves wearing the bore of the body out. Yes. The other clever thing about it was that these two guide rods that support the piston assembly delivered air within the center of the actuator so it could put air into the end cap as it were or the center chamber to make it open or close without any external pipe work the the rods that held it, the assembly in place also delivered the air to the correct place ah yep very simple very clever very clever yeah and it took all the load on the guide rods the initial design I've got the one of the very first actuators in front of me at the moment. Yeah. The pistons travelled up and down the guide rods. In later designs, the guide rods were attached to the pistons, but uh, you, need, you need to see an engineering drawing to understand the, the, the subtle differences there. Right, okay. All, all the wearing parts, all the revolving parts, weren't metal-to-metal -metal contact, but it was metal to nylon a bearing material so that you you've got incredible long life. A, a norbro would do a million operations without thinking of it mm -hmm. and we've seen of them have done 15 million or more operations and never been touched that's remarkable so it is remarkable and that's putting it very mildly <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i was struck by if you were to hold up the the model of the original actuator next to one from today, the similarities um, in terms of how, how they look. And we'll, uh, we'll post a, a photograph side by side of uh, two, two actuators. But uh, um, in terms of the development process, as you say, really, really clever um, design. Yeah, very simple, very clever. Simple but clever. But but what were the challenges in terms of bringing this to to market and getting um, moving from a prototype to something that you could um, mass produce? Well, I don't know the ins and outs of the early marketing because I was involved with the manufacturer. But of course, at the same time, uh, Worcester Valve was in the UK, and Norris Brothers had the marketing rights to manufacture the Worcester valve, which was one of the first ball valves, quarter-turn ball valves, um, which, of course, needed actuating or automating. And so that's why the Norbro was developed. Yes. To automate Worcester valves. Now, it's obviously within the same ownership. Well, it's not ownership as such. In those early days, Norris Brothers only had the license to produce uh, Worcester valves. Eventually, they did become... Um, co-directors with uh, Worcester USA. Yes. Very complicated, that part. Um, however, that was that was the reason for developing the, the Norbro, was to uh, to be fitted onto Worcester Bowles, and then you went to market, well, an existing market, which they knew very well indeed. Right. And, uh, as I say, it, um, numerical control and, and automation was just coming out in the early 60s, mid-60s. Yes. Um, and all the pharmaceutical companies, oil companies, and wanted to automate the plant. Instead of sending a man out up a ladder to open a valve or, or you know, walking half a mile to open or close a valve, you could have a computer operate that valve or press just press a button from a remote location and it would move. And you also got a signal back to say it had moved. Yes. So you knew it had moved? 
Yeah. It's all about. And, and we so, couldn't make enough of them. And you couldn't get enough of them? You couldn't... We couldn't make enough of them. Yeah. The mom was out of this world. We were working 24-7. There was one stage, uh, I can't remember which year it was, but we went back to work on the 27th of December, the day after Boxing Day, yeah. and the very next day I had off was Good Friday. <laughs> that was seven right. days a week. Really? Right. Yeah, seven days a week. Good I week. Went 27th of December to Good Friday without a single day off. And when you and said demand through the roof, what sort of volume were you were you doing at the time? Thousands and thousands and thousands, depending what the mix was. Mm. Of you know, are they all small actuators or medium or big ones? Yes. Yeah. There is. Um, there's. Se- I mean, there's several. I've forgotten how many sizes of Norbro there are now, but initially, each one was designed that the guide rods, the support rods, would fit inside the next size up. It was a sort of a sleeve in arrangement. Oh, okay. So clever in getting just the, the almost doubling the power within the, the minimum amount of material increase. Yes, yeah. They, they really thought it out. And so your experience there then, um, your the manager of the plant at the uh, the tender, the young age of 23, um, yep. demand absolutely enormous. Tell mm. us then, where how, where did your, how did your career develop? Because as you say, you worked with them for, for, for decades. You worked with, uh, with, yeah. Nobre, with the Norrises for, for decades. Well, it, I, actually, I, I did manufacturing from my apprenticeship up until the age of 40. So right. I was involved with the manufacturing side of the company. Um, I was manager of, as I say, uh, we had several plants, but one of them was called Rice Bridge Works at Bolney. Yeah. It was a fair size plant. We had, a, I don't know, about 80 people or so working there, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So we had an anodizing plant. We always did our own anodizing, the aluminium components. Um, and phosphating of the carbon steel components. Yep. Uh, then we moved back to Burgess Hill, where we had several... Um... Ah, the reason for moving back to Burgess Hill was, of course, that we went from being a private company, Norris Brothers or and the Worcester Valve Company and all these little companies. Um, Norris's were... They were partial shareholding shareholders of the larger Worcester Group. Yes, there were also American directors in Worcester, USA, who had the majority shareholding, and they sold their shares to uh, the biggest industrial conglomerate in the UK of the time, a company called BTR, British Tire and Rubber. Mm-hmm. So we went from being a private company to being part of a huge conglomerate public company. Right, okay. Uh, and they made radical changes, but they but they were okay, BTR. They made massive investments, and we had lots of new machinery. We had lots of money available for, in, for improving production. Because Norris's were always a bit hard up for money. Um mm. Right. Design and development doesn't come cheap. Yeah, of course. So there's ever such... You needed a huge... With very deep pockets. Mm. Yeah. But as long as you could show a return on their investment, a good return, um, they didn't mind pumping the money in. Sure. Um, BTR became a huge company. I mean, it was massive. Absolutely massive. They owned Dunlop. They owned... Yeah. Oh, so many companies. Um, you'll have to look them up. They okay. don't really exist today because they merged with another company called CD and became and called themselves Invensys, who are still around today. Yeah. But it's not the company that it was. However, that, that's neither here nor there because <laughs> they then pulled off, they sold off our division to FlowServe. Yes. So when was that? <laughs> Which is another American company, but the but about a company and an actuator company. 
But that's and, that's way off in the future. We digress. We digress. Um, but you're saying, Mick, you 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 stayed in manufacturing to the age of forty, and was it then that you moved into sort of uh, international travel, international sales? Is that? I didn't start that quickly. I got I got to forty, and I I um, I just got bored with it. Mm. Manufacturing, like, oh, factory life is uh, is factory life, and I got bored with it. So I went to tech. They put me on a management course, uh, Brighton College, um, for a best part of a year. Yes. And then I, um, I came back, and there was a vacancy for a sales engineer in the southeast which uh, I applied for and got. And uh, within six months, they give me uh, European exports to share with another sales guy. So I did visits to, you know, just about every European country going. <coughs> and then eventually I got um, the Far East. Oh, no, the Middle East then. Mm-hmm. We did the Middle East all around, uh, yeah, and then uh, then the Far East, uh, China. I went to China so many times. I started off uh, our company in China, so okay. I went there with zero, and we we were doing big business. Time we finished. Were you and and um, where did where was the company set up in in China? <laughs> Initially in Beijing. Yeah. Now they're everywhere in China. They're, mm. they're a huge group. So, you, but when I went, I was the very first. The very first. So <laughs> that was good. Yeah, that must have been an adventure. That must have been exciting. Um, it certainly um, was to zero and find a distributor to the country that sends over here the cheap copies of the. In fact, I found a guy making a copy of a Norbro. Yes. And the cheeky old said, "Oh, you're actually very like ours." <laughs> Oh, you come, you comedy. Oh, exactly. It was the wrong colour. That was the only thing that was different about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what could you, what could you do in terms of protecting your intellectual property? Absolutely nothing. No. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. But, no, it was, it was different then. Um, they, they're more cooperative for, uh, today on on intellectual property rights. So yes. They are getting very much better at it. And we manufacture in China as well. So Yes. Yeah. So in fact, in bits and pieces. So it's gone from strength to strength. Yes, <laughs> strength but indeed. And, and you, you, the early days, places I went to, um, they hadn't even seen a white man before. So it was very, very early days. Right, OK, really early days. Did, did you enjoy the international travel then, Nick? Oh, I loved it, yeah. yeah. Uh, Spent 25 years traveling the world almost nonstop. Yes. <laughs> and they um, looked after you. You know, the company looked after you very well. They, um, you know, the, 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 the level of travel was good. The hotels were good. They never quibbled. They never made a fuss. If you've got the business in and then the other bits and pieces went along with it and everything was uh, well run and managed. Yeah, we, I was very happy with it. Yes, yeah, grand. And and meanwhile, during this time, what what's happened to the brothers Ken, Lou, Eric, and uh, Lewis, uh, who had? Um... The, um, well, when we uh, when we were part of BTR, they were still there. Not quite sure when they disappeared and went off to run their own development engineering again, and left. Up, well, we were left w- within. BTR and um, Invensys. Yes. Not quite sure when they went, but uh, eventually they did. They got they got bought out, and um, Osterbau became a hundred percent part of BTR, and then eventually Invensys, and then Flowserve. Yes. And they they took a back seat and carried on developing. They they carried on doing explosion proof boxes, uh, pumps. Uh, design work in general, even crop spraying. Uh, right. They developed a, a Wankel type rotary engine. Um, I say they've done the work on Bluebird. Ken Norris went on to become team manager of, I think it was Thrust, the early land speed car. Uh, Richard Noble. 
That's right. The Thrust SSC became a consultant to them, I think, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's in his blood. Right, grand. Norris Brothers were, were, were local. These, these brothers, they lived and born in Burgess Hill, where I live. Yes. So. Um, their father was a manager of the gas works. Um, there were five brothers. One got killed as a Spitfire pilot in the Second World War. Uh, that was Walter Norris. Right. Um, yeah. But the other four brothers, they just went on from strength to strength. Yes, and indeed. They had a good time, and we had a good time. I and remember the first year that Norbro did a million pounds in a year, and we had a hell of a party. <laughs> I mean, did you? Yeah, it's for a million pounds. It was fantastic. Yes, yeah. The productivity of each employee was measured very closely. Um, so how did they we, measure productivity? What did they use? What, did, what, what were you measured against? It was a piece part bonus scheme they had. <laughs> and for every hour you could save, everything was timed. Yeah. And for every hour you could save, you got paid a, 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 an amount of money for every hour you saved. Ah. Uh -huh. So you worked an hour, you got your hourly rate, your basic pay. But if you saved an hour, if it was supposed to, the next job was supposed to take an hour and you did it in half an hour, you did a hundred percent bonus, as it were. You got another amount of money on top of your basic salary. Okay, right. So, and if you got very clever, you could get several hours bonus per hour. Right. Productivity. It was even mentioned in the Daily Telegraph once about the highest productive company in the UK was Worcester Valve. Good grief. Yeah. Many years ago. But the productivity, the piece parts coming out were amazing. Uh, you know, the amount of work that was coming out per man was, was phenomenal. And the Norris's didn't mean mind paying the extra money because yes. the more you the more they get well well qu well quite indeed so it a, uh, so it so it, it was incentivized and yeah. it made the the company successful yeah, yeah. and then well, well I say I say we we hit a turnover of a million pound in a year and then I can when, remember just when I finished manufacturing I had to do that every week <laughs> 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 Pressure was on there, Mick. <laughs> million pound a week, yeah, you know, it was four million a month. It was, yeah, it was going some. Yes. Mm. So you've been retired now for ten years. Is that correct? Nearly ten. Years, yeah. yeah. Nearly ten years. So, so mm. uh, around two thousand and uh, two thousand eight, two thousand and nine, you you um, yeah. you retired. Um, so. Those those last few years before retiring, you were travelling all over the world at that point, is that right? So, yeah, anywhere north of the equator. My colleague had the south, he had all the hot countries, and I had all the bloody gold countries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you did you ever try and swap round? Or, uh, <laughs> no, we didn't want to do that. <laughs> Um, and since uh, since since you've left uh, since 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 your retirement, have you um, watched with interest the actuator, the valve, the, the process industry, um, or were you have you? Uh, I get I get, uh, I get little snippets occasionally. We have little gatherings of uh, old old team members and um, catch up with the gossip and what's happening. Yes. Yeah. Um, there was one big factory near me here that I initially found for Norris's. Uh, for yeah, it was Norris's, um, which became the the, Nor the main Norbro plant. It's very close to where I live because I, I, I literally went out and to find this forty thousand square foot factory, and I, obviously yeah. I chose somewhere near home. <laughs> Good for you, yes. <laughs> so I could walk to work. And we had that for about 30 years, and they closed it about five years ago. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it still uh, sits forlornly empty. Oh, does it? Oh. <laughs> so mm. uh, uh, forlornly empty, and only a few, uh, only a few minutes away. Um, yeah. But, you, but hey ho, they pay me, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and. Uh, uh, what, what are you doing for for fun and enjoyment uh, at the moment? Me, oh, I'm bit, I'm busy. Yeah. yeah, I have a classic. I have a seventy year old classic car, right. Triumph Road. Uh, yeah, 
which I uh, look after, maintain, and show at shows. And we do about 4,000 miles a year in it. We go around the continent to, in it. Right. And, so yeah, that's a really good time for that. And that's I, a Triumph I, I Roadster, did you say? Sorry. Uh, Triumph Roadster. Yeah. 1948. So yeah. Great. And so this Beautiful. is like Meccano for grown-ups, really, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a lovely car. Yeah. Grand. So you and you travel about 4,000 miles in that, go to shows, go to events with other enthusiasts. Yeah, it's very reliable. Um, we just came up your way. We went, we just did the Derbyshire um, about four weeks. No, sorry, five five or six weeks ago, we went up to Derbyshire and stayed in Buxted and, and um, went up Snake Pass and all around there. It was beautiful. beautiful. Oh, good. Did you get good weather? It is lovely up here. Yeah, well, it was perfect. Yeah. Um, 600 miles and a 70-year-old car and he never missed a beat. Oh, fantastic. That must be, uh, that must be incredibly rewarding. And, oh, it uh, is. Yeah. 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 Um, the other hobby I have is photography. Is, uh, do a lot of photography. And is that digital or, or film, Mick? Or, oh, yeah, it? no, digital. Everything's yeah. digital. Days, yeah. But I belong to a couple of camera clubs. Yes, yeah. About socialising, and I've got 11 grandchildren. Um, everything is very busy. Oh, I should think so, yeah. <laughs> I should think that keeps you really busy. Um, well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you, Mick, and really fascinating to hear about the Norris brothers, to hear about the development of, of uh, uh, the, the Norbro actuator, and yeah. to hear about your involvement and uh, working with the Norris brothers and, and your travels, your, your adventures in the industry. Mm. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. All right. I just wanted to say one other thing was... Mm. Our relationship with our distributors was particularly good, not right. only with the UK ones, but the, 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 especially Scandinavia. They treated us like we were family. We were part of their family and, and, and the other way around. They, they really looked after us and we really looked after them. Um, and we still, even though I've been retired 10 years, I still have communication with them. Uh, you know, two or three yeah. times a year, they want to know how we're getting on and this, that, and the other. That's, how many customers come back after ten years? That's want to talk to you. I think that's Amazing, a, isn't it? a huge testament to the fact that you obviously had a a wonderfully positive working relationship with them, and uh, it, was, uh, it was the horse, the old e, the whole ethos of the company as well. It was it was really good, very right. special. That's absolutely fascinating. I've I've really enjoyed hearing about that. That Mick, thank thank you so much. Well, thanks so much for for joining us on the podcast. It's 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 That's right. a pleasure. Um, if uh, you think of anything else, then uh, just let me know. You've been listening to the Valve and Process Solutions Visionaries podcast, produced and presented by me, Jamie Veach, on behalf of Valve and Process Solutions. Today's guest was Mick Pepper, involved with the development of the original Norbro actuator working with the Norris brothers and what a fascinating chat it was with Mick. Thanks Mick for the interview, thank you for listening and remember advice doesn't come in a box, it comes from Valve and Process Solutions. So if you want to challenge us to solve a problem, whether it's a single valve or an entire process, drop us a line, pick up at the phone or visit vandpsolutions.com We deal with all inquiries and requests for advice on a case-by-case basis so you get the right solution for your application or project. If you've enjoyed this podcast or if there's someone you think we should be interviewing, then let us know. Just drop us an email. Email kim at vntpsolutions.com Thank you for listening. 